Hey, both are both sports are old man sports. <laughs> yeah. Or retired man sports, I should say. Yeah, that sucks. The and you guys' first time was for the ACL. Why don't you go? Oh, that's my over playing that ball. It's like, oh man. Dude, and we saw three of these things on the car path when I think it was like yesterday. It's fun. Oh. The yeah, we saw three of them. Ranchers are harmful. No, they get so messy. Uh, they like shoot out their little fur and it like blinds me. Not like permanently, but like it gets in your eyes and it's painful. You know, big eyes too. All day. Yeah, dude, three of those things. Oh, that's great. Me and my girlfriend claimed that when we were driving, if we were only able to play 16 because it got dark, we were driving to the, in between the 17th and the 18th in the car path. She swore that she saw a snake that was crossing the car path, and I didn't see it. So. <laughs> I mean, Eagle Glen's for sure going to have snakes. It's like hella, yeah. you know, That's why I get scared when people go. Even at Master Birdie, I'm scared. Like, fuck. Uh, there's gonna be a swing. Yeah, I like, I've just only ever seen bunnies, rabbits, and deer at Eagle Glen. I've never seen any like any kind of deer in my diamonds. The cicada would be kind of scary. It's not scary to me. Yeah, dude, the ranch is. But you know, I don't have no one else to be What kind of fun did yeah, I hit my three once. I used it once. And I didn't pop it. I just think sliced it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to take this club like this club. This is funny. The people that we were paired up with yesterday, they were like, you know, pretty like, I don't know, the ball through. We probably shoot in the 90s every time. Like, can't hit the ball again, but like, still, like, it'll be in, you know, they're just going there. Um, on the second part five, where it's like you can not hear up to the and then you rip through it. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So I like did the same thing. I hit them perfectly, perfectly in the with a fairway. And then I like, hit three. Do you play points then? Yeah. But I hit three wood. And I had a little bit of an aggressive cut, but it's still, unfortunately, not the great age will go along to the fringe. But after I hit it, all the depth, all of them were like, oh my gosh, they're like, we gave the confidence, like, all right, we're pumping up. And then the first one, we completely like topped it for me. <laughs> so then the other guy's like, I'm not confident anymore, but he still goes through it and he hit it even better than I did. He hit it. I think I'm just going to buy him, he can do like a three iron or something. So I cannot hit woods. Really? Unless it's like a. I'm going to have to take a calorie wood, five wood. And that would be pretty nice. Just to have more of See, I've tried hybrids and I can't hit hybrids because I just hook them. So it's like for me, I have to have either a two iron. I, I could probably get away with like a second wood, maybe. I can eat my five wood, but like, or five hybrid, but well, my three wood. I've only ever cured that three out of three hundred years. I might buy like two or three iron. See how it goes from there. So nice to so change my group. Now it's just funny. I don't know, man. I don't think I time now. My brother just got one today. He was like using his mind. It was his first time using it. He left everything short. Yeah. 
like the only thing they have to get used to is we really have to be good at really it's it's really easy to like just kind of figure out and I think I still did that like once yesterday, but for the most part it helps just be changed again. I just need to pick you with us a quick last year please. No, I'm gonna make a fucking better tree with you. Maybe like a Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe like a lightning beer shift or something. I cried, I don't. Or they want to do the street, or they like draw just a little bit. My iron is just like, uh, you just like, you just mess with people. My chips can be more crazy. And, um, it's literally there's like so many people that are like I I walked in like a minute late because I couldn't find any parking this morning. So I kind of just like leave the parking shelf here parking all I said with the gene walking for and yeah, so after the conversation when we got to the park to the first Yeah, I saw your track because that's where I went. It said there's parking the fish. And I said the track. It's like you're spiking all this. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. I showed them. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. It says there's a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, but in that class, it's like, Brandon's feeling in there. Um, Aaron's saying there's no way to do that. And then it's Minjay. Josh, Diego, Apple Group, they're all in there too. Um, it's so late, it's painful. It's like you trust the facility to not random, just I started it and I, I got, I was just looking up the actual. I Pretty sure I did. Yeah, the way he did it in the like, actual review, he said he used the data to Um, <laughs> so the I was like, you look at the saddle the whole time. It's an easy language. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to check this out tomorrow. Yeah. You know, some of the That's like relatively how often we're going to be like meeting people. Like, I know one thing that would be really important, but like, from what he said, is he. I think that's like to them, right? But like, be like, uh, like he said that we'll be like working, like watching their initiatives. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh. So he's really just like a mistake in the class. Yeah. Hey, yo, I'm coming for that. I'm going to go to your house. I'm not driving. I saw it. I don't have to drive. I feel like it'd be too quicker. I just went to All right, it's uh, four o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Yeah, you good? Doing good? Sure. Um, so I guess uh, let me let me start off. I probably probably saying the most obvious thing on um on probably on some people's minds that's causing a lot of anxiety. So um so the, the wait list issue is still um I think unresolved as of now. I did put in the request on Friday morning to add everyone from the wait list, I think. Um there's been some issues with, with some of the other courses this semester, and so the department is focusing right now on making sure everyone is enrolled in all the required courses that they need. So mostly senior design, um, solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, things like that. And so I think there's been some issues with that. Uh, so the electives are a little bit less of a priority, but they said, uh, um, the department said that they would get to my request early this week. So either they're either work on it right now or, you know, either tomorrow or Wednesday, then, then I'll have an answer. But um, we shouldn't have an issue um, just because there, there weren't that many of you on the wait list. And so I think I'm probably only addressing maybe like three people uh, in the class, but you know, I'm hoping that it would all be resolved for class on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the meantime, we're we're still here. I did I did put in a request for a bigger room too, in case we need it. Um, and so I think you know they may be looking for another room for us as, as well. All right, and so the uh, the plan for today is um, we actually have another mostly biology lecture today, although it'll be I'll, I'll make some references to make some engineering stuff. Uh, we'll be we talking about bones, and so we'll talk about you know what you know. We'll talk a bit more in detail what bones are, what their properties are, um, and how we can actually measure that. We can that to uh, some of our more common engineering materials. Okay. And so we'll start it today, and I think we'll probably uh, finish it up on. All right, and so I think that's it for my announcements. Are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? So the, so the computer's working again. So for those of you on Zoom, I think the camera that's actually working is the one on the ceiling, which is mm -hmm. kind of cool. Um, so I, I don't know if this webcam here just doesn't work, but, uh, but you know, at least it's working today uh, and even working. So that's mm -hmm. All right, so let's go and get started. And so today's lecture is about the biomechanics of bones.
Okay. All right, so we talked last Wednesday, you know, last Wednesday was kind of our crash course in anatomy. And so we talked about kind of all the major, I would say, uh, different tissues that we're gonna go over in the body. So we have bones, uh, we have muscles, and we have joints, okay? And so over the course of the next few lectures, we're gonna go in detail, uh, more in detail about each of those uh, systems and talk about their properties and what they actually mean for us or, or what's the most important information for us um, as we start to learn biomechanics. And so we start with the bone, because I think bone is probably the most similar to kind of what we know as, as kind of engineering materials and, and material properties. Okay? Um, and so in short, you know, bones provide the structure of, of the body. Okay? Um, and so that and so that kind of has two um, two main uh, purposes. And so on the one hand, it, it provides you a rigid framework that, support, that supports and protects um, you know, all the soft tissue in your body. Okay. Because compared to the muscles um, and the joints, you know, and, and, and joints, I'm, I'm lumping in things like tendons and ligaments and things like that, you know, bones are probably the only tissue that I would consider as, as hard tissue, right? And so without the bones in our body, we'd literally just be a, a pile of poop or a pile of slime on the ground. So that, so that part's really important. Um, so I think that's probably the first, the first purpose of, that people think of when they think of their skeleton. Uh, but the other important purpose is that it, it provides a way for your muscles to actually um, give you movement. Okay? So the way that we describe that is it forms a system of levers that can be moved by your um, by your muscles. All the great, you know, uh, movements that we can do with our body, you know, playing sports, uh, you know, walking, even, um, you know, that's that's only possible because your muscles are, are, are excuse me, your bones are, are rigid and they can be moved around by, by your muscles. Okay, and so from these, you know, like I mentioned, bones are considered uh, heart tissue. And all that really means is, is kind of what you think it means. And that it's, it's compared to you know, softer tissue, which is more kind of squishy, bones are, are actually hard. And that, and that toughness and that rigidity comes from um, mineral deposits, which we'll talk about in a bit. By mineral, I, I mean mostly. Mostly, it's it's calcium. So that's that's the main mineral that's in the bone. Okay. Okay. 
but it's still, even though it's it's considered a hard tissue, you know, it's still considered a living part of your body. And so I think people kind of dismiss bones as kind of something that's very simple. It's just a hard thing that's in your uh, in your in your body. Right? And so, you know, if you're eating like a chicken wing, you know, you see the bones. It, it just seems like it's just something that's hard, but it's still living tissue. And still, it, and so it grows, it adapts to you, um, and you have to take care of it too, just like all your other tissues in your body as well. And so we'll talk a bit about that, maybe not today, but probably on, on Wednesday when we finish up this, this set of questions. Okay. All right. Another thing that we're going to talk about in this in this uh, set of lecture notes is maintenance of your bone health as well. And so uh, maintenance of bone health is something that's really important for humans. Um, although for most people, they don't really take it seriously until they're much older, but there's a lot of stuff that you can do now in terms of what you eat, your level of activity, that's, a, that's gonna pay dividends you know, much, much later. And by issues, you know, I mean things like osteoporosis and, you know, things like your bones getting weaker, making it harder to walk and things like that. Okay. Of course, you can, you can also hurt your bones as a young person too. Um, you know, if you if you skateboard or anything like that, or you play sports, you know, you're probably familiar. You may have broken a bone at some point in your life. And so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know, more common issues that that will start to All right. And so, you know, I'll, I'll say one more thing too, that bones, um, Bone, you know, bone studying bones and characterizing them and, and knowing exactly what they do um, is still very much a, a very hot topic of research. So people are still, we're still learning a lot about bones about how they work. And so, you know, what we're going to go over is you know, a small snapshot. Of course, you know, we're going to focus mostly on the mechanical properties because that's what we mostly care about in biomechanics. But there's a whole other side of like biology and, and you know, um, in terms of how, you know, their cells behave and things like that, that we're not really going to cover. Okay. But I did want to mention that, you know, this is not a comprehensive overview of bones, just enough of what we need to, you know, to study, study them from a biomechanical point. All right, any questions on, on this so far? All right, so let's talk about the, uh, the composition and structure of, of bone tissue. So of course, you know, I'm talking about the material composition and, uh, you know, the material structure of the Okay. All right. And so due to their unique role in the body, you know, the probably the most uh, desirable characteristic for bones is that they, they're they strong, right? They can maintain, they can sustain a lot of forces, a lot of stresses, and not break them. So think of like, you know, think of the construction of a building or a bridge, right? You want those supporting beams of the building to be made of something like steel, something that can that can hold a lot of weight. And so your bones play the same role in your ear. Okay. But at the same time, you know, if we think about the other role that bones play in your body as, as being the main things that um, your body attaches, your muscles attach to and cause movement, 
you know, another important property for bones is that they'd be lightweight as well. And so in that case, you know, your, your bones aren't really that different from your typical engineering project. And so if you've worked, uh, if you've had any experience in the automotive industry or the aerospace industry, you know, you're always asking for more strength, but less weight, right? And so if you're, if you're launching a rocket ship, you know, you want that to be as lightweight as possible so that you can cut down the fuel, cut down the costs, and, and, and so your bones are exactly the same. And so, you know, the material composition of bones kind of helps it achieve both of these goals at the same time. And so let's talk about kind of the materials that, um, that make up bones. And so like I mentioned, you know, calcium is a, is a big, um, you know, big contributor to bones and it appears in a few different forms. Okay. And so we have calcium carbonate, which is a combination of calcium and carbon. We also have calcium phosphate. Those are the main mineral uh, qualities. And then there's also collagen. So collagen is a uh, type of material that's in your body that helps kind of hold everything together. Uh, as well as water, surprisingly. So let's break down each of these uh, contributors and, and and let's see what they what they contribute to the overall function of, of bones. Okay. All right. So let's go over the calcium ones first. So both calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate. You know, they're slightly different molecules, but they but they kind of contribute in the same way. So I'll just kind of group them together as, as calcium. And so, you know, this is the main, uh, this is the main constituent inside bones. And so if you take the, uh, the dry weight of bones, this makes about 60 to 70% of the bone weight. Okay. And their main purpose is to give stiffness and compressive strength. So next we have the collagen. So collagen is not unique to bones. You've, you've probably heard some skincare commercials mention collagen as kind of the next super ingredient to, um, you know, in their, in their face wash or face cream or whatever. Uh, but collagen is used all throughout your body. And so collagen is, is kind of like, like a, almost like a sticky kind of viscous kind of a uh, substance that your body uses. And the main, um, the main purpose of collagen is to give your bones some flexibility. Um, and it does give a little bit of strength as well because it's it's you know not it's not exactly a fluid it's kind of a viscoelastic kind of material.
All right, and the last one is water, which I think you know people find probably most interesting. Uh, but water actually makes up a, a, a pretty large percentage of, of bone weight. And so it makes up about 20 to 30, 25 to 30% of bone weight. And the main purpose of water is, you know, like I, like I mentioned, your bone is, you know, living, living tissue. And so there needs to be a transport of, of materials, transports of nutrients throughout the bones. And so, you know, the main purpose of the water is to kind of give, give your bones kind of a matrix or kind of a, a way to kind of transport materials throughout the bone. Um, and so you can, you can almost imagine that there's like kind of little channels of, of water that kind of go through the bone. Um, but the water actually adds some strength as well. And what's interesting about bones is that once once the once the a bone kind of loses its water, its properties actually change dramatically. So the uh, the properties of the calcium, the collagen, as well. And so this kind of presents a lot of challenges. And so you know a lot of times when scientists study you know parts of the human body, you know they have to do it on cadavers or or, or dead people. But you know the problem with studying cadavers is that you know a lot of the water and a lot of the uh, um, you know the, the liquid that's in the human body kind of evaporates or doesn't evaporate but it kind of leaves the, the tissue uh, and so you know the fact that you know water is only really present there or it's mostly present in, in, in living people makes it very hard to study the properties of bones And of course, as you can imagine, you know, it, it's it's hard to get living people to volunteer their bones for study. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the scientific data, a lot of the papers that we're going to talk about later in the lecture are from animals. And then, you know, just because, you know, and and you know, of course this debate of course well, but uh, you know, generally, generally speaking, it's a little bit easier to get kind of data from animals uh, than it is from you know. All right. Um, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, and so you know when you compare uh, bones to kind of a more traditional engineering material, material like maybe wood or maybe metal, you know bones are a lot more complex, which is which is kind of what you would expect for from human okay. And another way that bone material properties are complex is that bones are not uniform in their material composition. So it's not just one; there's not just one bone material. And so if you look at different, even different sections of the same bone then you know, they're going to have different composition of calcium and water um, you know, compared to other parts or, unit or other bones. And so the exact composition and you know the exact properties of bones depends on the purpose of the bone. You know, certain bones are responsible for more weight bearing than other bones. Um, but even within the bone itself, like I mentioned, there's there's variations.
And so if you look at a bone in your, in your vertebrae, right, your vertebrae is responsible for a lot of weight. Here. And so if you compare the properties of that bone to one of the bones in your hand, but your hand is not really responsible for, for weight bearing, um, you know, they're going to have very different properties. And so the, uh, the bone in your vertebrae will probably have a lot more calcium and a lot stronger generally than the ones in your hand. And so one um, other really important property of, of bones that you know that I want to talk about is the idea of porosity. And so if you if you actually cut open a bone, um, you actually might be surprised to see that it's not it's 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 not the same thing as like cutting a metal. So if you if you have a bar of metal, right, you cut it in half. On the inside, you see nothing but metal. On the inside. It's just one kind of uniform cross section. Uh, but for a lot of bones, when you kind of cut them in half, you know you don't see uniform bone properties. You actually see you know lots of little tiny bubbles, lots of little tiny holes in, in the bone. And so the porosity kind of kind of measures that. And so we talked about earlier that water is, is, a, is an important uh, constituent of bone. And so inside these holes are those, are those water, is, is water, usually, most of them, okay? um, Sometimes they're filled with, with collagen and other, most, but it's usually mostly water. Right? Um, and so this kind of creates, it, it kind of almost makes the bone or parts of bones almost act like a sponge. And so it gives it kind of a spongy kind of uh, um, behavior where it, it has a lot of flexibility, okay? And so, in fact, you know, um, even if you have a, um, you know, just a, a regular, uh, you know, we'll take a long bone as a as an example. You know, different sections of the bones will have different levels of porosity. So, let me go ahead and draw a long bone here for you to see. And so, here we have kind of a typical a typical long bone. So this might be a bone that's in your arm, in your in your leg, something like that, right? Some some kind of long limbed um, bone. Okay. And so in the middle, uh, in the middle of the long bone, this is where usually most of the strength of the bone is is derived. And so we usually call this section the cortical bone. And actually, if you cut if you cut open the uh, um, the uh, um, the bone right here, you actually will see mostly a uniform a uniform bone. Okay, so it's, it's pretty it's going to be pretty much uh, one solid solid block. But near the ends, you're going to see pockets where there's going to be a lot of pores. Right. I'm going to illustrate that with kind of these hatch marks here. So this section here, this section here, you know, visually it, it looks like a, it almost looks like a sponge. It looks like a, like there's a bunch of little pools. Okay? And so those and so those bones where you where you have a lot of pores and you can kind of visually see all those those pores, these are known as trabecular.
right. And so the different and so the different parts of the bone, the cortical bone and the trabecular bone, obviously have very different properties, right? And so let's let's talk about these. So this is kind of one way to kind of classify the material properties of bone based on porosity. Uh, and because porosity is so prevalent within you know the, the skeletal system, um, it's it's kind of you know it's important to kind of know how to characterize porosities. All right, so cortical bone. So cortical bone, um, you know, from the from the picture right there, you can see it's it's very low in porosity. Uh, it's not completely solid. There, there is still some pores, but it's it's very low. And so usually, um, usually the uh, the usual um, uh, denomination is that usually five to thirty percent of its volume is occupied by non-mineral tissue. Yeah. So there's a high there's a high mineral content in the cortical bones, and so you know just like we mentioned earlier, right? Minerals give the bone strength, and so the cortical bone, um, as you expect, is very strong. It's much stronger, much different. And so a lot of the load bearing um, capabilities of the bone is due to the cortical cord. Okay. So long sustained um, compressive loads, you know, most of that is And so if you're standing up for long periods of the day, or even sitting down, right? You know, whenever you're, even if you're just standing up, you know, even if you feel like you're not doing anything, you know, there's there's actually a constant force being applied to our bodies through gravity. Uh, and so you know, your, your bones have to be able to withstand, you know, long periods of compressive force. And a lot of that is due to the cortical bones. Okay, next we have the trabecular bone. And so in contrast to the cortical bone, of course, the trabecular bones are a lot more porous. So we say these have high porosity. It can be anywhere between 30 to even 90% of its volume uh, occupied by non-mineral tissue. And so, of course, you know, because it doesn't have as, as much mineral tissue, um, then they're not going to be as strong. So they're uh, much weaker, but they are a lot more flexible. Oh, sorry, question in the chat. All right, question from the chat. Sorry, this was 10 minutes ago, I apologize. Uh, so is collagen a living tissue? Do cadavers lose collagen like in the water? Uh, what exactly is bone marrow and how does it affect uh, bone properties in a way? Yeah, a lot of good questions. So collagen uh, collagen is not living tissue. And so it's it's not it's not uh, alive in the sense that you would, you would consider a cell alive. It's more of like a, like a kind of a, like a, like a matrix kind of substance that um, that's used within the body to kind of transport the tissue. Yeah. Uh, so cadavers, um, they do they do have collagen, 
but they're not as active or they're not as flexible as, as a living person is because, you know, like you mentioned before, um, they lose, uh, cadavers lose a lot of water once, they, once they've kind of been dead for a while. So the collagen is still there, it's just not as active as before because they, um, because the water is, is kind of gone. So collagen and water kind of work together um, to kind of give give the body a lot of, flex, a lot of flexibility. Okay. Um, so question is, what exactly is bone marrow and does uh, it affect the bone properties in any way? So the bone marrow is is, is, is a combination of collagen um, and water and kind of other kind of uh, other um, non-mineral properties within the bone. And that, you know, it mostly helps in kind of transporting material within the bone. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, the bone cells that are responsible for growth um, are in the are in the bone marrow. Yeah. The bone marrow interacts more with the cardiovascular system, and so you know, bone marrow kind of produces blood cells uh, more for that. So we're not really going to go over that because it's kind of more on, on the cardiovascular side. Yeah, I apologize for missing. Usually, usually I'm, I'm a bit better with looking at the chat. Yeah. Um, okay, um, back to this. So um, so trabecular bone. So uh, oh, question. Uh, question: Does trabecular bones provide a provide a dampening effect on the joint? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great observation, and that's that's exactly where we're going to. Um, so trabecular bones, where you see them a lot, is actually near the joints, and so um, where your bones are going to interact with other bones in your body, that's where you're a lot more likely to see trabecular. Bones. Because what happens at your joints, right? So as you kind of go about your day um, and you're kind of moving your body around, right? As you kind of, you know, maybe walk or up and down or maybe you interact with things, you push something, right? At your joints, you know, your bone kind of interacts with other bones mostly. It also interacts with you know, your tendons and your ligaments and things like that. And so there are a lot of impacts that occur at your joints. And so with trabecular bone, because they're more flexible in nature, you know, they're much more likely or, or much better at kind of absorbing these impacts, uh, which can often be, you know, high amounts of force in kind of a short period of time. They can absorb these impacts and not fracture, not okay. Um Because if you think about, um, you know, uh, the fact that calcium is kind of the main constituent in cortical bone, calcium is very strong. Um, but another way that you can kind of describe it is that it's it's brittle, right? And so if you kind of if you kind of subject it to a very large amount of force in, in a short period of time, which can happen a lot, you know, throughout your day, you'd be you'd be surprised, um, you know, then you know the kind of the, the property of brittle tissue of brittle material is that they can kind of crack and um, and fracture much more easily, and so. The trabecular bone plays a very important role in that you know when you have these large forces, just like um, just like Annie Kent mentioned, you know they kind of act as like a damper, it's almost like kind of a shock absorbing kind of system, where it takes those large forces and it kind of distributes it kind of slowly over over a period of time instead of having it all happen. So you know that's a, that's a very important role that these trabecular bones play. Um, you know otherwise you know we'd we'd see a lot more fractures. You know just going on daily business. All right. Um, any questions on on this? Yeah, um, I was wondering, like, people that do Muay Thai, like uh, things where they're trying to like, get their bones to be able to take more impacts, is their bones becoming more coarse to be able to take it more? Or is it becoming uh, stiffer so they can like? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great that's a great question actually. Um, I have to I have to look into that a bit more. Okay. Um, because I'm I'm not sure exactly kind of I I I've, I've heard I've heard that before but but I've never really looked into kind of what they're doing a lot of a lot of times when when um you know um when you kind of train the body to kind of take more impacts when it comes stronger it's actually more in the muscles so your oh, muscles okay. your muscles have a lot more capability to kind of grow and kind of get stronger more so than the bones mm -hmm. um, especially especially you know as as kind of humans kind of get around this age then you know their bones kind of lose the ability to kind of grow as much as they did before and, and we'll talk about that kind of more. 
later. It's, oh. um, but unlike bones, your muscles can, can continue to grow and get stronger um, as you age. And so that's that's my that's my intuition, but I, I'd have to look into it more. Thank you. Um, any other questions on, on this? So what is cartilage? Is that made of the same material that bones are? Yeah, that's a good question. So cartilage is, is more softer tissue. And so it's 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 not nearly as hard because they don't have they don't have the calcium that, that bones have. And so cartilage is, is kind of in an in-between, it's it's not exactly a tendon because cartilage is, is is much more hard. And so your ears are kind of like the main, the main thing that uh, um, you know, the main example for, for cartilage. Um, but it kind of serves a similar purpose. But, car but cartilage is a lot weaker, so it can't sustain the bones as, as, as bones can. And so it's 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 a tissue, but it's it's kind of in between tendons and and, and bones. Yeah. Much more collagen than cartilage. That's why it's my bones. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. All right. So now that we now that we've uh, discussed kind of the material uh, composition of bones, let's talk about their elastic properties. Chat. All right. So bones go through a cycle like osteoblasts and osteoclasts to make new bone and help stay stronger. That's why. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we're going to talk about that probably probably on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, osteoblasts and osteoclasts those are the bone cells that help create new bones. So um, and so those those are still um, they're still active as as you grow. But they are most active kind of when you're in adolescence. So um, it is it is it is still possible for your bones, for your body to create new bones. Um, it's just a much slower process as as you get. Yeah. Actually, you know, funny story because um, I have a cousin. He's uh, he's 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 ten years old, and actually, um, around last Christmas, he had a terrible bike accident where his knife kind of got caught in a bike, and his his knife kind of you know. It was, it was gruesome. I almost threw up seeing the pictures. Um, but he's only 10. And so his bones are still very, very much happy. You know, his doctors did a great job kind of setting it back in and giving the body a chance to heal. And just like five months later, he was running around doing like backflips into his, into his backyard. So, but I know that, you know, if, if an adult had that kind of injury, you know, they'd probably be sidelined for you know, at least a year just because, you know, kids, their, their bones are a lot more active and grow. He's crazy. He has two two older siblings, and they had to cancel a, a family trip to Disney World because he got into that injury. And so his siblings hated him for like for like a month. Okay, so let's talk about the elastic properties of bone. And so what I mean by elastic property or uh, properties are things like. Uh, you know, when, when we talk about elastic properties of engineering materials, we're thinking of things like Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, density, uh, things like that. And so we're going to talk about how we actually characterize the properties of bones. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me start by saying that bone is, bone is a very complicated material. And so it, it's very hard to kind of describe it kind of simply. And in fact, you know, there's still a lot of debate in the literature in terms of how we actually, you know, quantify, you know, how strong bones are. So... You know, the exact specification, or at least what everyone can agree on right now, is that bone is characterized as an anisotropic material. And so anisotropic material is, is another way just to say that material is very, very complicated. Uh, but the exact definition is, is, is that the strength and the properties of the material depend very strongly on the direction in which you're looking at it and the direction in which the load is applied. for a second. Okay. 
And so one thing we'll talk about a lot today is that bones are very strong in compression. So you can, you can compress a bone and it can withstand a lot of that, a lot of that force, but it's much weaker in um, tension and it's much weaker in shear, right? And so if you were to take a bone and if you were to try to kind of you know, break it like a stick, you know, you'd actually be able to do that fairly easily because you know, when you're bending like this, then you're applying tensile and, and shear stresses to the bone. But if you were to try to crush the bone, that'd be much harder because bones are very strong in compression. All right, so this is the opposite, or this is the, um, you know, different than what's called an isotropic material. Um, when I talk material will have the same strength, has the same property, no matter which direction you load it. And so a lot of the materials that, that we, you know, that we usually discuss in engineering classes, they're usually isotropic in nature. Okay. And so most of your metals, um, you know, are isotropic and that's, that's usually the material that we, that we work with. And the nice thing about isotropic materials um, that you that you've worked with before is that you can we can describe their strength, we can describe their property using just a single a single number or a very few amount of properties. And that property is the is the Young's modulus. And so you're probably familiar with the following equation. And so if we if we write our typical stress strain relationship, we know that uh, stress sigma is equal to E, which is the Young's modulus, multiplied by the strain. Strain. E. All right, so from that equation, we can see that generally the higher Young's modulus that you have, the stronger the material is. Right? And so if you look at a very strong metal like steel, steel is going to have a much higher Young's modulus than a very soft metal. Um, maybe something like copper. Okay. All right. So that's the simple case. So that's that's for a simple isotropic material. So isotropic material, very simple. One more, one problem. Okay. And isotropic material, on the other hand, are much more complicated. And so, um, anisotropic materials can require up to thirty-six constants to describe strength. So 36 is a lot. Um, and, and I would say that, you know, practically almost no property uses all 36. 36 is kind of the, the most flexible kind of, um, um, you know, framework, but, you know, um, in theory, it, it can get up to that much, okay? And so our simple, um, our simple relationship here between stress and strain 
becomes a matrix relationship instead. And so, um, you know, we have something that looks like this, this sigma i, or maybe I'll call it sigma vector is equal to C uh, matrix. And so I'll underline that with the uh, underline. Let's cut some more on it. And so this sigma uh, vector here, this is a six by one stress vector. And this epsilon is also a six by one strain vector. And then this C, you know, if you compare this equation to our, our linear elastic equation above, you know, that C matrix is, is playing the same role as the Young's modulus. But now instead of being just a single number, this is a six by six matrix. So that's so that's the that's the most difficult case, and so that's the most um, I would say um, not just for bones, but for any material. Um, you know, you can use this kind of uh, the system here to describe these properties. All thirty six. Practically speaking, you know, it's it's very hard um, to use all thirty six properties because you know that means that if you have a if you have a material, you have to perform lab tests to determine what all thirty six of those properties are. Um, and it's going to be a lot more, a lot more complicated than just a simple tensile test. Right? And so, practically speaking, I don't know. I don't even off the top of my head. I can't think of any properties that that use all thirty six. Usually, there are some kind of assumptions that are used to simplify this this system. We use assumptions to kind of simplify this. It's just you know true not only here but in a lot of engineering as well. Uh, but unfortunately, here here comes the debate because you know there's there's a lot of different assumptions that you can make. Um, you know, and, but of course the debate is you know what are the correct assumptions to make and are they actually justified for describing bone, uh, which is very very complex. Okay, so we'll talk about you know two of the more common assumptions that people make for bones. Um, and you know we'll talk about how that simplifies the material matrix, um, and then we'll go over some some data that people have measured. Um, uh, actually, a couple in humans too, um, in terms of how they were able to determine what these properties are. Okay, okay so let's go over the first uh, the first uh, assumption that people usually make, and so that is uh, assuming that the, that bone is transversely isotropic. All right, and this is an assumption that's usually made for for long bones, so um, you know the bones that comprise your, your your legs and arms, things like that. Okay, and so what transversely isotropic means is that we assume symmetry um, around the long axis of the bone. And so what this means, and so you know, if if we if we draw the long bone as kind of like a cylinder, and so if we take kind of a cross section here, okay, so I'm gonna draw that cross section here. Okay. And so transversely isotropic means that as you kind of go around this cross section, kind of like a clock, 
then there's no change in material properties. There's no change. There's no change in material properties from this from this um, slice versus this slice versus this slice. Okay. So all slices are. So this is this is not a bad assumption. In fact, you know it's it's pretty reasonable because you know the only you know the only factors that would cause bones to have any kind of uh, variations in that in that kind of rotational direction would be if the bones were experiencing torsional loading, uh, which is very uncommon. So so bones are not ex exposed to torsion very much at all, um, or if they were kind of biased, um, you know, in, in some way, which is also not that common. So you know the way that a lot of humans kind of go about their day. Um, you know, bones are really only loaded in compression. So this is this is not this is this is a pretty reasonable assumption. To make. Okay. Okay. So with, but with that assumption, we're able to simplify our matrix quite a bit. And so instead of thirty six uh, unique parameters, um, we only have to solve for five parameters here. In the chat. Question, but won't that contradict our statements? Bones are not uniform material properties. Yes, uh, it does. And so, you know, these, these are assumptions. And so, um, you know, when you compare this to kind of the, um, you know, the most, uh, you know, um, the most flexible framework, which is pure anisotropy, um, you know, this, this, is, this is definitely an assumption. But, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, uh, we make these assumptions, you know, first of all, to kind of make them easier to, to work with. Um, but it's also a lot easier to come up with these uh, material constants if you make these assumptions as, as well. Okay. And so kind of the practical difficulty with the with the full you know 36 parameter system is that you have to run lab tests to determine you know what are the 36 parameters uh, for for that bump level. Um, and so when you make some assumptions like this and you assume kind of beforehand that you know that the bone has some kind of symmetry, then it simplifies your test a lot test a lot better. Yeah. And it makes it a lot easier to find those constants as well. Right. Um, so I'll give you an example. So, you know, tip is if you have kind of an unknown metal, right? A metal is, you know, for the most part, we can assume is an isotropic material. And so they only have one material property that we that we care about, which is the Young's modulus. Um, and so to find the Young's modulus, you know, the most common test that you can perform is a tensile test. And so you kind of rig up you know, the piece of you have like a rectangular piece of the metal, and you kind of pull it apart until it breaks, and then you measure. Um, kind of the relationship between the force that you apply and the amount of deformation that that you see, and so you know in that one simple test, you know you can find that that one material property for the bone or for the piece of metal. Um, when you have thirty six material properties, you know you you don't need thirty six tests, but you do need a lot of tests. Um, and the unfortunate thing with a lot of material testing is that they are kind of destructive in, in nature. So you know you can't use the same bone for you know. You know, let's say you know ten different tests, so it, it kind of becomes a lot more difficult to, to get those bonds. And so, um, and so, what scientists have, or what researchers have done is that they've kind of made these assumptions, kind of based on the typical use case for the bones, um, just to make it kind of easier to estimate these material properties. Yeah. So it's definitely it's definitely an assumption, uh, and you know how how valid an assumption this is, you know, I think is still kind of up for debate. Okay. Um, so that's transversely isotropic. Um, and so another assumption that's often made is to um, kind of almost assume that bones behave in the same way as wood. And so, um, you know, if you, if you know anything about wood material properties, wood has, you know, fibers that kind of run through it. And so you can apply different material properties in the same direction of the fibers um, as opposed to kind of, you know, perpendicular. To so bones do not have fibers. Um, but we do know from, from, from simple testing that bones are much stronger in compression. Um, and so we can kind of use that kind of same material model to describe the properties of bones. And so this type of material model is called an orthotropic material.
And so the idea with orthotropic materials is that you kind of assign each, you kind of assign three parameters per uh, direction. So you, there's, you assign kind of one um, normal stiffness parameter and two shear stiffness parameters per direction. Um, and, you know, most of the time we're, we're, we're talking about these in 3D. And so orthotropic materials will have nine, uh, nine overall parameters. And so on, on, on what I have here is I, I do have some measurements, um, you know, based on literature. Um, some of this data is pretty old, um, but we do have some measurements under this uh, orthotrophic assumptions. Um, and so scientists were able to run some tests on some bones. Um, you know, I, I assume that these bones, um, they, they still have kind of the water, and so they, they were valid. Okay? And these are some of the, uh, the prop, see, these are some of the values that they, that they obtained. So I have three studies here. I will name them according to their uh, to their author, uh, and I also mention kind of what uh, which bone and which um, organism it came from. All right, and so the first one is by um, looks like a Dutch dude, so his name is um, Van Busker. Is from 1981, and this is on a pig. Uh, in particular, the femur of the pig. So that's that's the thigh bone of, of the pig. Okay, and these are the nine uh, measurements that he um, that he obtained. Um, and I'll leave a note that all these measurements are in Giga Pascal. And so I'm, I'm just going to go off the kind of the usual um, name for these for these parameters. Uh, but of course, these you know these numbers may not mean much. So C11, C22, C2, uh, C33. These are all the normal stiffnesses. Okay. All right. So we have 14.1. All in capacity at all. So these first three columns here, these are all the normal stiffnesses. Okay. And the direction three, so I, I don't have it here in the notes, but I think just but just based on the numbers, direction three is down the down the long axis of, of the bones. So that's that's kind of down the down the barrel of the deeper. Okay. All right, now we have all the shear, um, all the shear um, parameters. We have C four four. Five, six, six, six. And in the note, in the lecture notes, I have a matrix that kind of shows you where these material parameters are in that six by six matrix. Um, but just kind of in the interest of time, I want to make sure we get through the next thing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll leave that up to you. But even just with the numbers here, um, it's it's kind of it's kind of illustrative to kind of see what they are.
So all of these parameters here, these six, these are shear parameters or shear stiffnesses. And you'll notice that these parameters here are a lot lower. Right? And so they're about a full, at least half, um, maybe sometimes even less than that from the, from the normal surfaces. 7.0, And so you can see in the in all the shear directions. Um, you know, the stiffnesses are a lot smaller because, you know, bones are normally very weak in shear. Okay. So let's look at the data from NETS. And so NETS, this is from 1978. And this is actually from a human. So this is a human tibia. And so the measurements here are, of course, going to be different because humans have different needs, different, uh, um, you know, different kinds of different levels of activity than a pig. You know, but the same trends are still going to be there. And so our normal stiffnesses are going to be much higher, especially C33, which is down down the length of the uh, of the bone, um, and then all the shear stiffnesses are going to be lower. So I have, I, have, I have one more uh, experiment in the notes, but you know I think you know just from here you can kind of see that. Okay. Um, and so you know again you know this these measurements were taken under the assumption that bones were an orthotropic material, um, you know which which I will tell you right now is it's it's people have, have kind of challenged that assumption because what this orthotropic assumption assumes is that we have you have the same strength in compression as in tension. And so that's why there's only one stiffness for the normal direction or normal stiffness in each direction. Uh, but we know just from observation, just from kind of experiments, that bones are, are weaker in tension than they are in compression. And so the fact that this, um, this model here, this assumption doesn't, doesn't account for that, you know, there's some weakness associated with that as well. Okay. But, you know, I, I bring this up just to kind of show you that, you know, um, that we do, we do know a fair bit about kind of the material properties of bones and how they behave, but exactly how we characterize that and how we actually put some numbers on it is still um, still kind of uh, a topic of research because you know it is very difficult to get data and to measure these things um, in terms of living. living. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on on this? Yeah. All right. And what's even more challenging. Which will become a theme for for the whole class is that you know um, if you look at if you look at two humans if you look at the the femurs for both of those humans they're going to have different properties because you know two people have different um, you know size different weights different levels of activity right and so not only is it it's it's already very difficult to measure these properties of bones but you have such large sometimes very large variations in between people as well as it's, it's, it's that makes them probably more difficult. Yeah. How much of a difference does like your human diet have in terms of like your, I guess, um, your solid material properties when it comes to both? I should say. Oh yeah, it makes it, it makes a huge difference, and so you know that's why that's why you know they tell you when you're younger to drink milk or to try to get as much calcium mm -hmm. in your system because that that goes straight to your straight to your bones, um, and so you know a lot of times you, you a lot of times you don't really notice the difference when you're kind of growing up. 
because you know your your bones are growing kind of such kind of a rapid pace that you know you can't really do any activity that really tests that. But where you actually see it occur is actually in older people. And so what we'll talk about, you know, probably on Wednesday is that, you know, the way, the way kind of your, your body kind of stockpile strength is that, you know, when you're young, when you're kind of in adolescence, you kind of, your body's in kind of stockpile. So you kind of stockpile this kind of huge um, deposit of calcium just based on your diet. And then once you kind of reach a, so once you kind of reach adulthood, then it becomes very hard for your body to add calcium, no matter what you do. So you, your, the amount of calcium and strength in the bone strength slowly declines as you age. But you know, what really kind of helps you in, in later life is that when you're younger, if you reach a higher peak, so you kind of stop out more calcium than someone else, then you're gonna have much stronger bones in, in your in your old age. The decline rate is the same, but you know, you want to reach kind of a higher peak when you're young. Yeah. And older people too, you know, they a lot of times they have to take things like calcium supplements um, and things like that to kind of supplement the strength. They've already declined kind of decline to such a state. So this is going to be, I think, frustrating for, for a lot of you. So once we get to the final project, you know, um, someone, someone, one group always tells me that, you know, it's, they're trying to do a project where they examine, you know, maybe kind of the strength of, of a prosthetic limb or something like that. And then, you know, they have to research, you know, how strong a bone is. And it's, it's a very frustrating exercise because you're looking through the literature, you're trying to get, you know, a good number, but it's just, it's just not there because, you know, the, the, it's just so hard to measure these properties. And, you know, there's so much variation between people and it changes as the person ages and, and things like that too. So. Uh, yeah, it can be very, very difficult um, to, to find good numbers on points. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so I think in the last five minutes, let's talk very briefly about bone shapes. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we've been focusing mostly on the long bones, just because I think those are those are the ones that generally people think about. And 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 actually, you know, those those are kind of the most interesting from a biomechanics uh, point of view. Um, but there's lots of other bones in your bodies with different shapes, um, and those different shapes help them serve their different purposes as as well. So let's go over very quickly a few. Uh, so let's go uh, let's go over short bones first. And so short bones, these, 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 the, where you find most of these bones are going to be in your hands and your feet. Okay. And if you look at them, they, they, they almost look kind of like a cube or cube, cube, they're kind of cuboidal in shape. Uh, and this and this structure, you know, you know um, they're not exactly cubical, but then they they do have kind of flat surfaces on them. It allows them to kind of slide past each other relatively easily. I'll draw one quick, one quick figure. And so if you look, if you draw kind of the bones in your hand, it look kind of like this. Not exactly cubical, but you know, they do have kind of large flat surfaces and they mostly interact with other bones. So 
So these kind of longer ones at the ends here, this would be like your fingers. And then these ones here would be kind of the short ones, okay? Okay. Next, we have flat bones. And so flat bones, I, I kind of call them almost like the armor bones because they, they kind of almost look like uh, plates of armor at different parts of your body, okay? And so they're very flat in, in shape. Um, and they're kind of designed to, to kind of protect some kind of sensitive organs um, underneath them. But their flat, um, their flat structure actually gives them another advantage as well. And so because they're kind of flat, they have a very large amount of surface area relative their, to their volume. And so, you know, these are actually great places for muscles to attach as well. All right, so one great example of this is in your shoulder, actually, which is your scapula. And if you look at it, it, it kind of it kind of looks like a, a piece of shoulder armor or, or a shoulder pad, right? So it looks kind of like it's, it's kind of triangular in shape, and so it kind of looks something like this. So what you'll see is that, you know, this large surface area, a lot of muscles kind of attach to this, uh, to this here, okay? Your shoulder muscle is, is one of the most complex in your body because you have such a strong range of, a large range of motion in the shoulder. And so, you know, um, all those different muscles need somewhere to attach. And so a flat bone like the scapula uh, provides that really, really nice. All right, any final questions on this before we wrap it up for today? Okay, uh, so there are two more bone types, but you know I'm not going to keep you past five fifteen. So we'll go, we'll start with that on Wednesday, uh, and then we'll go into uh, bone development and growth. Okay, so kind of answering kind of some of the questions that came in. Uh, all right, and so uh, thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, if you're still on the wait list, you know sit tight. Hopefully, it will be resolved by Wednesday. Uh, and then just kind of kind of All right, so thank you guys. Uh, can you guys on the But usually, if there's calculations, then I'll prefer you write it down and take a picture of this. That's fine. So, uh, if you can do like it for like an SMB seven diagram, so I can use a little bit of numerical things. So, then we can type the things, and yeah. the rest of the thing, we can attach it there and like, handwritten and scan. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So that's fine. Really bad at handwriting. So oh, I see. If you write, then you won't be able to press them. I see, I see. I, I know what some people have done too. They've used like the equation, equation yeah. editor, and that's that's fine too. So. Uh, which, whichever, whichever you think. Okay. As long as I can read it, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we going to, what is your expectation in terms of like, memorize? Do we have to memorize the, the stuff from the last lecture? 
I mean, I think eventually you will just just by just based on repetition. Um, for the exams, um, I do I do let you I do let everyone have a cheat sheet for the exams, and so any terms or any kind of definitions that you want you can put on on the cheat sheet. And so, uh, and so you know, there's there's going to be no quiz where I ask you to kind of just kind of name all those things. Uh, it'll be good to know them just as we bring up these terms like like scapula or something like that. Then you kind of want to talk about. So you have to be able to tie everything together. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because I'm already figuring out ways to memorize it. I try to memorize as much as possible. Oh yeah, I mean it'll it'll I think just just by just by repetition and having it come up and and I'll, I'll you know every time I bring something up I'll draw a diagram and kind of tell you what part of the body that's in. Um, then I think you know, it'll it'll start to become more. Uh, but yeah, keep keep those uh, keep that lecture notes from last Wednesday kind of on hand so that when you see a term or something like that you can kind of refer back to that. Okay. That's good. And then, um, so like, um, there's that, there's that question that I think brought up in the lecture, um, oh, the, like, act, um, the bones acting like a damper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the ends of the bones. So, like, the, 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 the yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. Um, I think they, they probably done like studies where like they kind of like model it like as a spring mass damper system. Oh like yeah, that. oh for sure. So you can use like what you're learning mechanical vibrations. Because that's basically what's what's happening. It's as you're walking, it's dampening. Otherwise, if 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 um it didn't act like basically like a spring and a mass, then then you would have a problem, wouldn't you? Yeah. It'd be just like stones kind of hitting, hitting, hitting against each other, which would be pretty bad. Um, there's actually, I don't, I don't think it's here, but I think, I think when we talk about kind of the lower body, the lower extremity, there's actually a study that we're going to talk about where they actually modeled the leg as kind of like a spring mass damper system. And they use that to design, uh, what's it called? Um, the, uh, this, like, have you run on kind of running tracks before where the surface is kind of like, like kind of bouncy or sticky? Oh, there's some parts that have like, um, I mean. The material like yeah 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 so they so they they use i mean they they modeled the leg as kind of like a mass spring damper and they they observed a lot of people running and they were able to kind of estimate kind of what the spring constant spring constant mm -hmm. for the leg is and they use that to kind of design this material for the track that that minimizes injuries and actually increases performance too to kind of like act as almost like kind of like a resonating spring so that when a person pushes off of it and it kind of actually like supports them and when they push down on it then it then it kind of lessens the impact too um, so yeah, there's a lot of parables that you can make like that and, and, and do some very good ones. Yeah, it's interesting how that um, looks like how you can take concepts from other parts of mechanical engineering and apply it to, to biomechanics. Oh yeah, yeah, and and that'll be a theme throughout the entire class. And so you know, like like I mentioned last week that you know biomechanics, you know, we're going to use all the same tools that that you probably learned in other classes before. It's just applying it in kind of uh, unique and kind of interesting ways. Um, to the biomedical space. Yeah. And there's some applications that are, that they're coming up with and that are yet to come up with. And um there's just a bunch of different things. But um the, the other interesting thing that I find is like um when you're trying to do accident reconstruction and trying to figure out like mm -hmm. the injuries that happen or 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 if they're doing like you know they're doing um you know Crash testing and whatnot. Yeah, like how they're able to figure out like the forces and, and oh, yeah. whether whether it's going to result in injuries or not. And and you know, like you said, you wanna you want to spread out that that the impact force over a longer period of times so that um you don't end up taking it all at once. Exactly. Yeah. No. And that's and that's interesting. And and and, and someone was was it you? I think brought it up on the first day of class. So, yeah. That's that's something that. Yeah. I, I know I know it exists, but I actually know actually kind of very little about. And so I, I kind of get the general idea of how they do it, but I, have, I haven't read any papers or, or kind of any, you know, read any textbooks about that stuff. So I think that's definitely something that I'll, I'll look into this semester as well. Yeah, I was trying to get a, an internship for this summer, but I didn't get anywhere with that. Oh. But yeah, this company out in Long Beach, I forget what it's called. And they use, um, it, it, it was for like a book. Biomechanical engineering position, but basically to do forensic. Okay. To do the forensic part of it, so like you know, slip and fall or accidents or vehicle accidents and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of want to just go and like go talk to someone and and ask them like because it's something that's so specific, like 
if you wanted to, if I wanted to get into that, like, what do I have to do in order to do to do that? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'd be. I mean, that sounds that sounds like a really cool job to, to do. And then you can use you can use that kind of analysis and, and and data to kind of better design. You know, how you design a floor not to like slip. You know, as, as easily. You know, I mean, and, and there's tons of engineering in cars. That, you know, if you do have a catastrophic injury, catastrophic crash, you know, how do you design the car in a way so that it doesn't crumple and destroy you? <laughs> You know, yeah, because there's a bunch of you know the serious accidents where you know the, the there's either intrusion into the into the occupant space or or just like especially in those offset funnel collisions where usually um, the driver ends like the 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 floor actually the car ends up like moving several inches or up to a foot mm -hmm. or more and it basically traps them and it you know crushes their bone, breaks yeah. their ankle and and like how to figure out like now they have like some cars even have like call it um airbags for the knees and, or the oh really yeah for this oh part. okay yeah. oh i didn't know that yeah some cars are equipped with those airbags which i guess to try to you know slow down or spread that impact over a long right, period right. of time but yeah but um on you know it's it's really hard to be able to do that because it's like you said like the materials like and probably like also the design in terms of how it, you know how it will deform when it's you know over there. In fact, then the speed, but it's just so many, oh, yeah. so many variables. So many variables. Like yeah. the angle yeah. and, and so forth. The exact force of the crash to the exact direction. It's, it's impossible to kind of account for, for everything, but 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 there's but there's still a lot that you can do, like knowing kind of the exact biomechanics of how, you know, exactly how it, it'll happen, how it'll impact the human. And there's, there's still some things you could at least do. And sometimes, and a lot of times, those are kind of be probably the difference between life and death. It's also sad because I mean to to be able to like, you know, sometimes you're kind of like trying to find the answers to like family members and what happened. And yeah. it, it can be I wonder if it weighs on them or if it just or if they just try not to focus on that emotional part and just like just try to obtain the facts based on you know science and whatnot. So yeah. I was thinking about that too. Like I wonder if that if I were to do something like that, it would weigh on me. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe maybe it would. Because you know, it's those you know, something that in some cases it could have been preventable. In other cases, it's just kind of like a wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. I think any 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 time you work on systems that have like human safety or human health kind of as as part of it, I think that's that's something that you have to think about. Because I yeah, I, mean, I have friends that work at hospitals. And they kind of always ask themselves, like, we have not some injuries before. And you know, for for engineers that work on those systems too, even like you know, you work on like a building, you know, something happens in the building, of course you're gonna be thinking about it. So, yeah, it's it's hard. And then the last thing that I wanted to say was um, I was looking into that uh that um hard lung bypass machine stuff, uh -huh. and I came across this um case where this uh, young kid. Some somehow somehow something ended up catapult like it got catapulted into his chest and oh. I didn't I didn't know that um there's a certain amount of force that the if the if the chest receives a certain amount of force that can cause the heart to like fibrillate or something. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know that yeah that, you know if you get hit hard enough in the chest it'll cause it'll cause your heart to fibrillate so they they um I think he ended up with lung injuries and so forth and yeah, it was really bad so yeah he did go into cardiac arrest but um. They were able to use that heart lung bypass machine to, to basically give him more time for his. I don't know. I think they. I think the lungs were able to recover, but they, he just needed that extra time, like you know, to allow his lungs to heal. Oh yeah. To be able to you know, you know, be able to like live without being hooked up to the machine. Oh yeah, yeah. The human body is amazing. It, it, it can it can heal like even the most traumatic injuries. But yeah, sometimes all it needs is some time. So you know, it's it's interesting because like. <laughs> Like you hear about all these like uh, really expensive devices, expensive procedures, and you and you read the paper, and it's like, oh, you know, this buys the patient just a couple of hours, you know, wow, you know, all this engineering going to a couple, but like sometimes that's that's all you need, just just a little bit more time for your body to recover and kind of get, get back get back on track, and then, and then you're, you're, good, you're good from there. But then the flip side of that is like the like the ethics behind it in terms of. For some people, like that, those technologies, it's kind of like they call it a bridge to nowhere. Where, you know, I read another case where his family members put 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 the the, the husband and the father on on that machine, and unfortunately, there was no way. Like as soon as that, as soon as that, as soon as he was disconnected from that machine, he was going to die. 
and there and there was nothing. There was no. I think at that point there was no intervention, and actually that patient actually was mad at um, was mad at the family members for putting for putting him on that. He would because yeah. it was traumatic because he knew he was going to die. And, right. Right. And there was nothing to do. Yeah. So then the, to examine the ethics is like really interesting, but also you know really exciting. Yeah. Those those kinds of things are always yeah, you had you know, yeah ways I know. Yeah, it's different. It's different for every kind of situation. Yeah, there's no one. You know, one because you know if you're working on something as complex as humans, and you know, there's no you know straight answer for every single case. It's going to vary. Exactly. Case and yeah, so many variables. It just makes your you feel like your head extends exploding. Oh yeah, yeah. There's and, so many possibilities. And and in a lot of in a lot of cases, there's no right answer. And so you just kind of have to do just kind of the best that you can. You know. But even then, you know, you're still going to run into issues. You know, people are going to criticize you, but, you know, that's just kind of the reality of, of you know, working on human human stuff. Yeah, like uh, people criticize, like, the, that, um, what they call it, the CPR machine that automated them. Um, well, one of them is the Lucas chest compression system. Yeah. And uh, some some uh, some people are, I don't know if they were trying to sue sue the company or something because of the damage that it made. It was, you know, sometimes in some cases it does, I don't know if it does, what kind of damage it does to the sternum. But I was like, that seems kind of petty though. <laughs> it was like, okay, would you rather be dead or would you rather like be living but with like, you know, some damage to your sternum or something? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, some, sometimes cases like this kind of bring out kind of, yeah, kind of people like that. But, you know, we live in a very, in a country that's very, uh, lawsuit happy and so sometimes people kind of look at an opportunity to profit on it. and sometimes it's not really sometimes it's not the victims themselves but it's like lawyers that kind of you know prey on on situations like that where you know because the lawyers are the ones that really stand to profit on it. So, yeah they'll take 30 percent yeah plus other you know plus more money yeah so that's the only way it'll be lucrative because yeah. um because they have to like to to be able to like you know to, you know, come up with the burden of proof and all that stuff. But then you'd have to, then you're going to have to find experts, and then experts are going to be fighting against each other because yeah. I'm right and you're wrong. And and it just gets really messy. Just like the, really messy. yeah, when you have medical malpractice cases, you have like doctors who are supposed to be experts and you have them contradicting each other. <laughs> and then if you're in the jury, you're like, I'm not a doctor, but like, who do I believe? Like, yeah. Like I don't. This is not my area of expertise. So how would I, you know, how would how would a jury determine which one of the experts to believe? Right. Right. So. Yeah. And a lot of those cases just come down to who can be more like emotionally, like you know, persuasive, <laughs> more so than like more hard facts. And things like that, so. yeah. Unless you have, unless you know, there's two doctors on the jury or something. Yeah. And then they probably want to. They would probably not want them to be on the exactly. jury. To yeah. Be they probably they probably wouldn't be. They probably wouldn't be asked to be on the jury. Yeah. Or the or the lawyers would dismiss them. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, oh, and uh, I didn't know that you were interested in the battery thing. You you replied back. To oh me. yeah yeah yeah. I mean it's it's something I've wanted for a long time. It it's just I used to do that like I would unplug when I'm at eighty percent, but like. Now, like now, I'm just so busy. I just leave it plugged in until it's 100 percent, just for convenience sake. But uh, I would, I mean, and but because like nowadays, my friends are like, oh, you know, that's just a myth. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. But you know, but of course, you know, I I don't know if it's just the devices that are just designed not to last that long. But like my laptop battery is basically dead, and so if I leave it unplugged for like 20 minutes, it'll just die. And so wow. it's basically I, it has to always be plugged into the wall. And I always wonder, like, is it because because my laptop's like almost six years old now and yeah. so it's like i wonder if it's because i got to plug in plugged in so much but it's possible like if you left it for a long period of time but then like without disconnecting it uh -huh. because i i guess they say that having the state of charge at 100 for long periods of time is, is what um cause um, the, uh -huh. the, the cells to break down or whatever i see i see but um like it's I guess I guess the answer to that question is very complicated, but 